update. Hello everyone and most welcome to 1928 of the series. We will do the e-edition of uh, Gilles Deleuze Essays Critical and Clinical. Gilles Deleuze. Translated by W. Smith and Michael Grocco. Last time we examined briefly the apocalyptic program to the prophetic project. And what we mentioned here was that destiny could be seen to be postponed. What does this what does that mean? Well, obviously it has implications for what we what we see as real. The reality of the world. And for something to be real, it needs a criterion. Criterion, according to the logocentric view, is in the present. It's a sort of present presentation, not a pre, like in the past depending on what we've done before, nor is it something that is affected by the things we normally do. The deference. Rather, it is some sort of congruence where both are participatory. Both are involved in the project, so to speak. Both acting, doing things. Being in, on, in, in the project, being on in the project, being active. The active aspect is the most important, I'd say. Definitely, it is something we do. We also mentioned that there were seven trumpets, seven seeds, and seven vials. The number seven, as we mentioned before, is very pertinent when it comes in connection with 12. In quantum mathematics, 12 can be divided by seven. And by quantum mechanics, we also get the year 1927. Three concerning primes are occupying the different spaces at the very same time. That, in the same way, is quite remarkable and unusual confluence. You also mentioned the new word, postferred. I like that one. <laughs> it was rather good. Postferred. <laughs> well, why not? Instead of deferred, it's placed after death and after the death of Christ and the death of each and every person. So let's reinstitute. reinstitute Postferred. <clears throat> I think it will be a most important expression. <laughs> Postferred. Ah. 
I will continue to read where I left off last, beginning with the Apocalypse, the very last sentence on page 41. The Apocalypse breaks not only with prophetism, but above all with the elegant, the immaculate no, imminence of Christ, for whom eternity was first experienced in life and could only be experienced in life to feel oneself in heaven. And yet, it is not difficult to demonstrate the Jewish sources of the Apocalypse at every point. Not only in the postponed destiny, but in the entire system of reward punishment, sin redemption, the need for the enemy to suffer. A long time, and in his spirit as much as in his flesh. In short, the birth of morality, of morality. Morality! and an allegory as the expression of morality as means of moralization, moralization, moralization. Bring it forward. Moralization. 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 <laughs> but what is even more interesting in the apocalypse is the presence and reactivation of a diverted pagan source. A pagan source <laughs> that the apocalypse is the presence and reactivation of a diverted pagan source. Sorry, that the Apocalypse is a composite book. Composite book is not extraordinary. It would rather have been surprising in this period if the book were not composite. Lawrence, however, distinguishes between two kinds of composite books, or rather, two poems.
in extension when the book includes several other books by different authors from different places, traditions, and so on. Or in depth, when it straddles several strata, traverses them, mixes them up, if need be, making one substratum show through the surface of the most recent stratum, a probook, and no longer a syncretic book. A pagan, a Jewish, and a Christian straiton. These are what mark the great parts of the apocalypse, of the apocalypse. Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> no longer a syncretic book. No, it's no. no, even if a pagan sediment slides into a fault line in the Christian stratum, filling up a Christian void. 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 Lawrence analyzes the example of the famous chapter 12 of the Apocalypse, in which the pagan myth of a divine birth with the astral mother and the great red dragon since the emptiness of Christ's birth. Birth! Birth! Such a reactivation of paganism is not frequent in the Bible. One can assume that the prophets, the evang evangelists, and St. Paul himself were well aware of their heavenly bodies, the stars, and the pagan cults, but they choose to suppress them to the maximum to cover up this straitum. Straitum! <laughs> straitum. straitum! Where are you? <laughs> Straightum to cover up this straightum. <laughs> there is but one case in which the Jews had an absolute need to return to this straightum, namely when it was a matter of seeing. when they needed to see. When 
vision assume a certain autonomy in relation to the word. The Jews of the post-David period had no eyes of their own to see with. They peered inward toward the Jehovah at the Jehovah till they were blind. blind. Then oh, they looked you. at the world. With the eyes of their neighbors. Eyes of their neighbors. <laughs> With the neighbors. When the prophets had to see visions, they had to see Assyrian or Chaldean visions. They borrowed other gods to see their own invisible god by. The men of the new world have need of the all pagan eye. This was already true of the apocalyptic elements that appear in the prophets. Ezekiel needed Anaximander's perforated wheels. It is a great relief to find Anaximander's wheels in Ezekiel. But it is John of Patmos, the author of the Apocalypse, the book of visions, who most needs to reactivate the pagan source. And who is the who is in the best situation to do so? John knew very little about Jesus and the evangelist. And what he knew, he knew poorly, poorly. But it seems to me he knew a good deal about the pagan value of symbols, as contrasted with the Jewish or Christian values. 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 <laughs> Values here we see Lawrence okay. 
with all his horror of the apocalypse. Through this horror, experiencing an obscure sympathy, even a kind of admiration for this book. Precisely because it's sedimented and stratified. Stratified, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Nietzsche also experienced this peculiar fascination for what he found horrible and disgusting. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> disgusting. How interesting it is, he said. Lawrence, no doubt, has a certain sympathy for John of Patmos. He finds him interesting. Perhaps the most interesting of men. Oh, yeah. He sees an excessiveness and presumptuousness in him that are not without that charm. 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 <laughs> This is because the weak, these men of resentment who are waiting to wreck their wages, enjoy a hardness that they use to their own advantage, to their own glory but that comes to them from elsewhere. Elsewhere! <laughs> Their profound lack of culture, the exclusivity of a book, that for them assumes the figure of the book. The Bible and especially the Apocalypse. Apocalypse allows them to remain open to the thrust of a very old straitum. A secret sediment that others no longer care to know about. to know about. Um. Care to know about. Saint Paul, oh. for example, is still an aristocrat. Aristocrat, aristocrat. Aristocrat, maybe. <laughs> Yo. 
not an aristocrat like Jesus, Meow. but a different <laughs> type of aristocrat who is too cultivated not to be able to recognize and thus to efface or repress the sediments that would betray his program, his program. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what censorious treatment St. Paul is able to apply to the pagan stratum and what selection to the Jewish stratum He needs a Jewish stratum that has been revised and corrected. But he needs the pagan source to be and to remain buried. Art. Buried. Oh, no. And he has enough culture to do so himself. 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 John of Patmos, however, is a man of the people. <laughs> He's a kind of uneducated Welsh miner. <laughs> Welsh miner. Like Tom Jones. Lawrence opens his commentary on the apocalypse with a portrait of these English miners whom he knows well and marvels at. Hard, very hard, endowed with a rough and rather wide, somewhat special sense of power. Religious men per, par excellence, brandishing the apocalypse with vengeance and self-glorification. organizing Tuesday evening meetings in the primitive Methodist chapels. <laughs> primitive Methodist chapels. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the apocalypse with vengeance and self-qualification. <laughs> <laughs> Their natural, natural leader is neither the Apostle John nor Saint Paul, but John of Patmos. They are the collective and popular soul of Christianity. Whereas St. Paul and also Lenin, Lawrence adds, was still 
an aristocrat. Or an aristocrat. No. <laughs> no. Who went to the people? Miners know all about straight. <laughs> they had no need to be well read for the pagan depth rumbles deep within them. <laughs> They are open to a pagan stratum. They set it loose. They make it come to them, saying only, It's coming, it's Christ. <laughs> it's coming, it's Christ. <laughs> <laughs> They bring about the most fearsome diversion of a stratum so that it can be used by the Christian mechanical and technical world. The apocalypse is a great machinery. An already industrialized organization, a metropolis, by drawing on his own lived experience, Lawrence thinks of John of Patmos as an English miner <laughs> and, the <laughs> and the apocalypse as a series of engravings hung in the miner's house. In the miner's house The mirror of a popular hard pitiless and pious face. face. It is the same cause as, as St. Paul's, the same enterprise, but it is by no means the same type of man or the same process or the same function. St. Paul is the ultimate manager <laughs> Why John of Patmos is a laborer, a terrible laborer of the last hour. <laughs> the last hour. The director of the enterprise must prohibit censure, censure, and select. Whereas the laborer must 
hammer, extend, compress, and forge a material. The material. Oh, oh, oh. Forge. <laughs> this is why in the Nietzsche Lawrence Alliance it would be wrong to think that the difference between that targets targets Saint Paul for one John of Patmos for the other is merely an anecdotal or secondary. It marks a radical difference between the two books. Lawrence no Nietzsche's Arrow well. Arrow but in turn, he shoots it in a completely different direction. <laughs> Even if they both wind up in the same hell, dementia, and hemoptysis, with St. Paul and John of Patmos occupying. All of heaven. But Lawrence soon recovers all his distrust and horror for John of Patmos. For his reactivation of the pagan world, sometimes moving and even grandiose in the first part of the apocalypse. What is it used for? What is it made to serve in the second part? It would be wrong to say that John hates paganism. He accepts it as almost as naturally as his own Hebrew culture and far more naturally than the new Christian spirit which is alien to him. His enemy is not the pagans but the Roman Empire. No, the pagans are not Romans but rather the Etruscans. They are not even the Greeks, but the Aegean peoples, the Aegean civilization. But to ensure the fall of the Roman Empire in a vision, the entire cosmos must be gathered together, convoked, brought back to life, and then it must all be destroyed so that the Roman Empire will itself be brought down and buried under its debris.
Such is the strange diversion, the strange expedient through which one avoids attacking the enemy directly. To establish its ultimate power and its celestial city, the apocalypse needs to destroy the world and only paganism furnishes it with a world. It is therefore it therefore calls up the pagan cosmos only in order to finish it off to bring about its hallucinatory Destruction. 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 <laughs> Lawrence defines the cosmos in a very simple manner. It is the locus of great vital symbols and living connections the more than personal life for cosmic connections the Jews will substitute the alliance of God with a chosen people for the supra or infrapersonal life, the Christians will substitute the small personal link of the soul with Christ. For symbols, the Jews and the Christians will substitute allegory. Allegory. Allegory for symbols. And this pagan world, which despite everything, remained alive and continued to live deep in us with all its strength is flattered, invoked and made to reappear by the apocalypse but only to make sure that it is definitely murdered. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not even out of direct hatred, but because it is needed as a means. The cosmos had already been subjected to many blows. <laughs> <laughs> but it is with the apocalypse that it dies. <laughs> and this is the perfect spot to put a pause. It dies. Dies. Mm, dice, dice, dice. 
page 45. It was quite a long read. Yes. Almost one hour. Oh, yeah. No, it was one hour. Twenty seventh of November. Indeed. <laughs> the Conference de Solvay, most important event in Christian history, next to the birth of Christ. Let's see. Possibly could go to page forty three. Forty three. Forty three. Forty three. Voila, forty three. No, sorry. Forty two, I mean. Okay. Forty two. It's called it. Voila, forty two. Second paragraph, about six lines down. But what is even more interesting in the apocalypse is the presence and reactivation of a diverted pagan source. And then the next sentence we jump on. Lawrence, however, distinguishes between two kinds of composite books or rather two poles. In extension, when the book includes several books by different authors from different places, traditions and so on. I'd say these are the many that one makes up a singularity. That makes it to be of only one place, one author, and one cogenial direction. This is most important. So, apocalypse is not sheer presence, it's also the past and the future. Or, as I was thinking to suggest, an extended presence that in its lead brings in both future and past to make it much wider and broader. More encompassing and inbringing. To go further down, it's the stratum of seeing, and that would be another, another couple of lines down, it's about nine lines from the bottom. Yeah, it's about there, yeah. And we have already mentioned there that there are pagan sediments. In most religions, that is a, a good cue for purity. So for Christianity in southwestern India. To be absolutely pure, you need to take in other elements. It's the same as cast iron. It needs a little tan, copper and sulfur become strong and vigilant and one union. There is no strength in absolute consistency and coherency, as we know from Gödel. And as we know from chaos theory, the weakest thing that there exists in the universe is something that is absolutely uniform. 
and the tendency in Christianity to bring in only one trait are not original. They are placed upon Christianity. Oddly enough, from the same pagan elements that we've been looking into before, although maybe not from the imperial cult, but rather from Greek general thinking. East Mediterranean thinking in the terms of Estain and Osea. The idea of not being is a non-existence. A very interesting influence that has been disregarded but taken up by Derrida. And I say indirectly here also by Gilles Deleuze. But I, if we continue here on the sentence I began with, there is but one case in which the Jews had an absolute need to return to this statement, namely when it was a matter of seeing, when they needed to see, when vision assumed a certain autonomy in relation to the word. The Jews of post-David period had no eyes of their own to see with. They peered inward at the Jehovah till they were blind. We need to do both. Keep an eye both on the inside and the outside. When they are in the penetrating, interpenetrating, indeed, yes. <laughs> this is when we get the strength of an alloy. And all strong things are alloys. The strongest things are definitely alloys. They're well used. It's a known fact. This is how reality works. We go to the next page. There's once more a mentioning of the Jewish stratum, about 15 lines from the bottom. He needs a Jewish stratum that has been revised and corrected, converted, but he needs a pagan source to be and to remain buried. And he has enough culture to do so himself. John of Patmos, however, is a man of the people, is a kind of uneducated Welsh miner. <laughs> and he also make uh, an irony of, the, of it on page 44 the Welsh miner turns into something completely different English miner and I think uh, I didn't notice that at first but that's an intentional joke the arch the former arch enemy of the English is the Welsh, two different people. But all of a sudden, in the next page 44, they all become English, English minor. <laughs> and I like this trope. It's a beautiful depiction of mining coal. And John of Patmos is the miner as well. Crude, there's no need for arrogance or the aristocracy of St. Paul. He is an aristocrat, I'd say, mewing down there in the deep shafts of the mining field. <laughs> Doesn't it make a great picture? <laughs> and of course, this comes from a technical and a mechanical viewpoint 
which makes it a fast, stern method of reaching into the deep core of the meaning of the revelation, I'd say. It's the mind and glory of realization coming from the foundation. Cabot, please, come and comment. You Welsh minor or... Let me go to... Or finish H41. H41, where we started. Oh, then, yes. Um, and let me go... Uh, we learned this last time. Apocalyptic vision replaces the prophetic word. Uh, so, uh, so uh, here, supposedly in the book of Revelation, vision has the is the primary thing. Uh, and then later on, um, the vision that he has is supposedly pagan since only the pagans could see. Um, here, we saw it already here, about the Old Testament prophets who were able to see, but they were, when the Old Testament prophets saw, they saw visions with, old, uh, with pagan eyes. Oh. And it's uh, contrasted to the written text. So here, uh, according to Lawrence slash Deleuze, uh, vision is prioritized. The Pagan uh, vision is prioritized. Okay. Instead, word, um, the, let's say the Jewish Christian word is is uh, doesn't have priority it's something inferior to lawrence mm -hmm. um yeah uh, i can agree with lawrence or deleuze that uh, visions do have a great place but i think it's artificial to say that there is some kind of opposition between vision and word uh, because they entangled I'd say uh, vision and word are entangled in the whole Bible. Oh, I yeah. can separate vision. Everywhere, the eye. everywhere I would say they are entangled. Mm. So, uh, mm. let me continue. Uh, there are many. And then he speaks on page 42. Uh, it was on here about the autonomy of the seeing <laughs> but it's completely it's impossible it's, it's an impossible supposition oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see what so you, you could even say that Lawrence slash Deleuze is unscientific here oh, oh, oh. Uh, let me see where, where was the phrase um, ah yes autonomy a vision would be okay he uses the word a word but we can use a word as a world we add the l yeah i thought about that as well very good color mm, so it's, it. it's impossible uh, because it's in god one physics is the eyes that create things mm. and how can you separate it with the from the written word that you actually see yeah, yeah, exactly. Very good. <laughs> I like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And word and world are always entangled, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, one letter that separates them. Mm. Uh, but let me go to something they are else. Coming together, interwoven, and always ruled by interpenetration. Mm -hmm. And I think also the be one of the best ways to actually to crush, or if we can use the word or refute the argument of Luther about sola scriptura. You use the English word, uh, only word. Oh, and yeah. Add on the L. You cannot separate the word from the world. No. Ah, oh, yeah, very good. Martin Luther cannot separate tradition, liturgy, and the materiality of the church and its parishioners 
and mm-hmm. all what that includes from the word. Very good. Mm-hmm. I think uh, it works well. Actually, I, I like homonyms. Uh, they are not homonyms, absolutely not, but they are very, very, very close. Almost mm, homonyms. They were rather close, yeah, I'd say. Yes, and, yes. And then, um, so there is a lot of fun expressions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yes, indeed. But, but I, we could say that uh, for Lawrence slash Lelius, minor, being a minor, is a, uh, he is a hero. For, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, it's not only for Lawrence and Elus that minoris can be a he- hero in one sense. Yeah. We have actually two other people who uh, he- uh, uh, glorified minors. Yeah. One, one was the author, um, um, uh, let me see, uh, 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 Zola, of course. Zola, the French author Zola, Emily Zola. Ah, um, Zola, Jacques. Yes. Yes, yes, the same one. He he glorified the French minor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they were the uh, heroes of his time, and and I I have sympathy for the uh, Zola that he took the side of the workers in a very noble way. Uh, it was not gratifying to be a minor. It was no. very dangerous work. So I I'm touched by Zola's engagement for the workers. And and um, also another person who fought for the for minors was actually Van Gogh, mm-hmm. because oh, yeah, before, did, yeah, that's true. before his painter career, he went to preach. He was a pastor or pastor's uh, apprentice, and um, he worked with them, uh, and he slept, um, and he lived last la- the minors did. Yeah, common life, and he depicted. Uh, Common peasants, the potato eaters is one very famous. Mm. And I, I, in this picture, yeah. actually, I can see John of Patmos and Van Gogh together in this metaphor. Ah, yeah. Uh, so it's the same glorification, Van Gogh and uh, in uh, John of Patmos as a minor. Ah, yeah. Mm, um, and, and I like this. I think it's a coal is a Christ, so coal is black. Mm. And yeah. so Christ yeah. is not always black. So this is a good metaphor, actually, to yeah. get rid of this uh, image as Christ only white. Oh, yeah. Um, but the thing with the stratum, of course, as you know, Hans, is the metaphor is, is misleading because it supposes that you should find the proper origin somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, it does. does it oh. doesn't it, yes. Although in this okay, in this case it would be the source would be let's say the diamond, and I don't know what the English miners, what were they looking for? <laughs> Perhaps you know coal. Uh, what was there? Uh, uh, the Welsh miners are looking for coal. The English miners maybe they're looking for coal as well. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the blackness actually is a good metaphor mm. for. So uh, origin should not be uh, pure white. But it can be black. Oh yeah, yes, definitely a mixture. It could be grey. So this actually be that we can actually learn from Deleuze hmm. that all sins it should it's not should be um, it's not pure. It is always no, something pure would be extremely weak. The only weak things in the universe in physics are the ones that are homogeneous, hmm. and mm-hmm. these ideas are actually Greek. Mm. They're being taken in, into Christianity with the Estain, the Osilia, and all those things, and had a great influence, and of course, possibly led to the demise of Christianity. Mm. There is nothing strong in purity. There is nothing pure about purity. It mm. is just the opposite. Yes, and I think this uh, we can take with us this metaphor about Christ oh. as a coal. Oh. Um, it's a good one. I like yes, it. it's an excellent, it's an excellent. I think. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I do like it. Mm, like the uh, heroes of uh, Belgian miners in Van Gogh's case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do um, like those. Well, remember, the strongest thing in the universe is a galaxy, and it is 
only made of heterogeneous things and they're all striving in different directions mm. but this thing will never cease to exist and mm. the christianity that has invigorated not rejecting the other will be immensely strong quantum mechanically strong mm. it will show the way to permanent life the free will and the human soul mm. Yeah, maybe we should end there. Yes, yeah, so let's uh, stop there. Mm. Thank you very much, Kalle Lundahl, for participating. Great, as always, with your fantastic comments. Thank you, everyone, for watching in. Have a beautiful day, morning, or afternoon, wherever you might be. Bye-bye for now.